I fire a large wood kiln. It's not <laughs> perhaps the most sound way. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of loss. But what you get out of it, if you've put, I think, your full heart into it and energy and commitment and time and focus, uh, you end up with something uh, that's quite unique and uh, extraordinary. Working with clay is so basic. Depending what kind of clay you're using, it, it can be so responsive and alive. My name is Eric Smith, and I'm a functional potter, and I live in Cummington, Massachusetts. Jill and I ended up in Western Massachusetts after my apprenticeship ended in North Carolina. We were going to set up a pottery and where she was going to continue her gardening and landscaping design business. Everybody loves watching a, a potter make a pot. There's something amazing about it. I feel the same way when I see a woodworker turning a bowl. I, I'm blown away. I can't, I can't believe they can do that. The material for me is just so unrestrictive. It can really bite you. It's easy to lose pot. I lose pots all the time. But when everything is just right and they start coming off the wheel, it's this really beautiful, almost exchange between you and the material where you feel like you're really working together on this thing. The way I work, at least, it's a very, uh, it, it's, it's pretty athletic. You know, I stand, I don't sit. There's movement, and I move, and the, the clay moves, and, and together we create these things that, on the, the best of days, will even blow me away. I'll come back in the evening and think, wow, that's, it's hard, I can't believe I made those. What I like about the material is that it does not feel precious. And that's why I choose to make functional pots. I don't want things necessarily to be looked at. My primary focus is that they're used. So the materials I use here are fairly straightforward. I get a, a stoneware clay from North Carolina that gets shipped up uh, several times a year. I get about a ton. It's just a clay that I trust and I like to work with, uh, so I am willing to go through the effort of getting it up here from there. I also worked in North Carolina during an apprenticeship, so the clay has some connection to that time for me, and it has a familiarity about it. There's a language of clay down there. This is a a craft, I feel, what I'm doing. Like a good electrician, when you go into a, a house where the, the walls are torn out and they've just put the electrical work in, and you see a, a good uh, webbing of, of, of electrical, it's like, wow, that, that's, ama that's amazing. It's, it's beautiful to me. Um, and I've always been attracted to that skill uh, of, of anything. Um, whether it's a good cook or a good work, woodworker or somebody that makes marble tops, uh, whatever it is, I, I've always been, it's from a kid, uh, from the time I was a kid, I've always been fascinated with that. So I take a great deal of pride in making a very good, well-made, uh, skilled pot. My intent is that people will pick these up and take a breath and say, wow, I need that. I think the response is that 
they're not challenging. I want it to be a, a very immediate response to where you see it and you want it and you're not sure why, or you see it and you want to pick it up and you're not sure why exactly. To be able to walk into someone's space, I think puts the pots in context that you, that is rare to see these days. It's very different than going into a gallery. I just want these things to end up in people's homes and in their lives and, and a part of, of their daily uh, rituals that they go through, whether it's scrambling their eggs in a mixing bowl or drinking their coffee or tea. There's nothing that moves me more than a great pot that I hold in my hands and can actually use and touch and feel. So you can take a wood-fired pot and turn it and I never tire of it. There's always something new. The surface quality is so rich and so deep. With wood, it's a ferocious type of firing where you're consuming a lot of wood. The wood ash is flying through the kiln. Uh, it's sticking to the pot, it's melting. Because the kiln is large, I need to make a lot of pots to fill the kiln, and I'm the only one filling it. You have to be fully committed to giving up a great deal as far as predictability. Oftentimes there are spots in this kiln and in other kilns where you know you might be risking it a little bit. So I spend about five days loading. I do that alone and it's a time I actually really enjoy. It's a puzzle. I piece it together every time. It's always different. And I take a lot of care and pay a lot of attention to making sure things are, posts are straight, shelves are level, pots are in the right spots as best as I can tell. And I do, I enjoy that time. So uh, after I load the kiln, you know, I break it up and we start uh, a, a small fire. And the temperature is maybe about 200 degrees. It's like a fireplace. And we, we depending on the pots that are in there, it's typically about a 24 hour and preheat is what that is. And then from there, we start raising the temperature very gradually, about 50 degrees an hour. And you just incrementally raise the temperature until you finally hit about 2300 to 2350. And that's typically on the last morning of the firing. The whole firing from start to finish is between 50 and 60 hours. This is a beautiful kiln and it's very responsive. You know, a lot of people struggle with their kilns to reach temperature and it's like, you know, shoving wood in and they're, and they're cursing and, and it can never get temperature. And this is this thing just wants to go up, 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 up. Um, so it's, it's more a matter of slowing it down and just making sure you take your time, which is why I have a kiln log. I have a, a, a good team of people that are friends and neighbors that uh, help out. We do uh, six hour shifts. So you come and it's all laid out what temperature you're supposed to be at, at what hour. And they follow the book and feed the kiln and raise the temperature uh, accordingly. I 
I then move to the to the back of the kiln and start firing the sides of the kiln, which is introducing wood actually into the, the, the ranks of pots that are set uh, from the outside while they're maintaining temperature up front. It's called side stoking. What that's doing is, is pulling the heat back to raise the temperature throughout the entire kiln, a 15 foot stretch. All the temperature is up to where I want it uh, throughout the kiln, high and low, front to back. I then salt, uh, so I use a lot of salt, about 100 pounds per firing, which we blow in with a modified uh, leaf blower with a funnel and a big nose on it. What that does is creates the salt glazing, which basically the, the salt is sodium, and so the sodium reacts to the silica in the clay and creates sodium silicate. I think in industry they would casually call that liquid glass. creates this beautiful, shiny, uh, very slick surface, which can also go kind of uh, what's called orange peel, or, or it's kind of mottled, speckly. But it's a beautiful surface that I love. We did a lot of salt glazing when I was, spent my time in North Carolina. We used a little bit of salt in the kiln I fired in Ohio. But North Carolina is where I really got turned on to the heavy, heavy salt glazing. And uh, I just, I love how it reacts to the clay and the glazes and, and what comes out of it. It's very uh, powerful and there's a lot of movement and because it makes things run and uh, it makes things bright. And I, uh, I love that. I try not to get too overly attached to anything because that is part of the process. And that's really what this place is about, is process.